because the way things are going, we will not survive beyond 2023. There is a serious risk that there will be a nuclear holocaust within the next 12 months. So obviously the biggest foreign policy story in Canada and the world continues to be Russia's special military operation in Ukraine. What is your view on that? Hello there. Welcome to the second episode of the Canada Files speaker series. This time I am joined by Dmitry Laskaris, a long-term activist, lawyer, and former 2020 candidate for the Green Party uh, leadership race. Dimitri, thanks for joining us. Hey, Aiden, thank you for having me on. No worries. So, Dimitri, you have a national profile, but your backstory is actually not as widely known. Can you walk me through the years before you joined the Green Party Justice Critic in 2016? What were you doing and what provoked you to change course and get directly into politics? Uh, I'll try to make this uh, reasonably brief, but because it's a long story. Uh, but uh, I was uh, born and raised in London, Ontario. My parents, uh, I was born in the 60s. My parents came to Canada in the 50s from the south of Greece. Uh, they had lived through the, uh, the depression, uh, the Great Depression. They had lived through a very brutal Nazi occupation of Greece. And then they lived through the civil war that followed. And it, but it was, by the way, a civil war that was very much provoked by the British because they didn't want to see uh, the communists who had so effectively resisted the Nazi occupation come to power. And so the country was basically a train wreck by the time we get to the 1950s. And my parents didn't have a year of high school education. Uh, they had very few prospects. They lived in a poor farming community. They had very few prospects to lead a prosperous life. And the Canadian government at that time was, to put it bluntly, looking for cheap labor from Southern Europe. Uh, and so they invited you know, people from Greece, and I think also from other Southern European countries uh, to come to Canada on a boat uh, and take up, uh, you know, residence there, where I think they, it was anticipated that they were going to do sort of menial work that, you know, established Canadians didn't really want to do. Uh, and so my parents came on a boat, they arrived in Halifax, they took uh, a train down to uh, they, in, in Montreal, and then Toronto, and then they ended up in London, Ontario. And um, my family came from a conservative background. You know, I was raised in a sort of traditional Greek Orthodox home. Uh, they weren't far right by any stretch of the imagination, but they were definitely conservative and traditionalist. Um, and, and they were Greek nationalists. I remember them teaching me as a kid that, you know, I'm a Greek first and a Canadian second. Uh, and that if Canada and Greece ever went to war, I would be expected to fight on the side of the Greeks. <laughs> That's this kind of upbringing that I had. Uh, and, and then I get to, you know, by, by, by the time I got to my early twenties, I was, I was quite right wing. Uh, and I, however, started examining these suppositions, particularly when I graduated from law school at the university of Toronto and I went off to New York city. I think that's when I really began to question, uh, the value system into which I had been born and under which I had been raised because I saw firsthand as a lawyer in New York City in, on Wall Street how uh, the United States, the supposed bulwark of freedom and democracy, was a grotesquely unequal society in which a narrow white male elite exercised enormous power, uh, and much of it behind the scenes, and that it was being used to the detriment of workers and the poor. And I became, after several years of doing that, even though it was a very... Um, I would say, you know, useful experience in terms of honing my skills as a lawyer. It was also a soul crushing experience uh, and one that really caused me to begin to question uh, the orthodoxy into which I had been born. Um, and then uh, I was so disenchanted by it, I left the legal profession for a while. I uh, became a professional blackjack player along with a group of other uh, uh, disenchanted lawyers and bankers from Wall Street. It was perfectly legal what we did. Uh, but we basically started taking on casinos, huge multi-billion dollar corporations, and saw uh, there too, I mean, un sort of unintentionally, I, I saw another aspect of the injustices in society and the way in which these multi-billion dollar corporations ruthlessly, ruthlessly exploited people who were just sort of living uh, at the margins of subsistence in American society. Uh, and then I came back to the legal profession after realizing that I really, really wasn't doing anything that had any social utility. It was interesting, it was sometimes fun, 
Uh, I managed to make a living off of it, uh, being a card counter, but it certainly wasn't something that was spiritually fulfilling. So I decided to come back to the legal profession and this time to be on the side of uh, workers and consumers who were being abused by uh, the corporatocracy. And I became a class actions lawyer in Canada. Uh, and that was another sort of awakening for me uh, because I really got some extraordinary insights into the level of corporate abuse in our society and the level of impunity for those corporate abuses uh, and how the system, the judicial system is frankly stacked against those who try to take on the corporatocracy. And then uh, for me, uh, so by the time I get to like 2007, I was uh, uh, entirely reevaluating sort of my conservative orientation, the one that I had when I became a young, young adult. Uh, but something that was really a game changer for me was that in 2007, a friend of mine uh, who was left wing uh, persuaded me to read Noam Chomsky's Manufacturing Consent. And I did. I read it uh, voraciously within a matter of days. You know, as you may know, Aiden, it's a thick, dense book full of facts. And I went through that thing in less than a week. And by the time I put it down, I was hopping mad, really angry because I felt that I had been lied to my entire life. And I was angry with myself that I hadn't realized the extent to which I had been lied to my entire life. And I, I allowed myself to be duped by the, the, the corporate media. Um, and at the same time, two other things were happening. Uh, at the same time as I read this book and went, underwent a political sort of transformation, one was uh, the fourth report of the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change came out. And for the first time, the IPCC stated that the evidence that human caused emissions were causing global warming was unequivocal. So they, in that report, they basically eliminated scientific doubt about the underlying you know, climate change thesis. And the other thing that happened was the financial crisis. And as a securities fraud class actions lawyer, I had a front row view seat on that uh, because a lot of people that I represented were victims of the fraud that led, you know, brought the global financial system to its knees in that period, 2007 to 2010. And ever since then, to be honest, I've been gravitating leftward. Uh, uh, you know, I'm kind of going the opposite direction of the sort of conventional political transformation. A lot of people I'm told they become more right-wing as they become older. Uh, I've definitely become more left-wing as I've become older. And, um, you know, I, I started looking around the political landscape, you know, around this time that I mentioned the financial crisis, uh, I had not been politically engaged up until that point in time, not in conventional electoral politics. I'd never been a member of a political party. I'd never made a political donation. And I said, you know, it's time for me to get in involved. And I looked across the political spectrum in Canada and I looked at the car parties in particular that had either seats in parliament or a reasonable prospect of winning seats. And I decided the Green Party was closest to my own uh, world view. And so I became actively involved in the Green Party around that time in 2007, 2008. Uh, and uh, now I look at it just to sort of conclude this long winded story. Um, and I realize that, you know, there is no political party in Parliament today that comes anywhere close to representing my views. It's, it's a sad, sorry, pathetic state of affairs, frankly. Uh, but I find it very, very difficult to feel any sense of devotion to any political party. Uh, that occupies a position in Parliament. Thanks for that. So you came you know, to more so to, I'd say to the left's eye, right, through debates around the Green Party of Canada's policy on BDS in 2016. So walk us through that fight. That fight. What led to it? And go from there. Uh, well, uh, for one thing, I, I my 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 partner, Farida, is, uh, she's born and raised in France, but her, she, she's, she, like me, came from an immigrant background. Her parents were Algerians uh, who came to Algeria around the same time that my parents came to Canada. And, um, you know, in Algeria is a country and the Algerian people are people who are deeply committed to the Palestinian cause. And talking to her about this issue started sort of opening my mind to the fact that the Palestinians were brutally oppressed people and the West was deeply complicit in this. So I started really paying attention to their cause, uh, you know, around the time that Obama was elected, uh, you know, shortly after he won in 2008, uh, the apartheid regime of Benjamin Netanyahu launched one of its savage attacks on Gaza. That 
And I was very upset about that. It was, you know, I, because I'd begun to pay attention to the issue and I was really disappointed that Obama refused to take a stand in defense of the Palestinian people. Uh, and then there were more brutal attacks on Gaza. And the one that really finally galvanized me to become involved in the Palestinian cause was 2014. Uh, you know, in the summer of 2014, when Israeli forces massacred over 500 Palestinian children in Gaza. And at, at that point in time, I was, you know, I, I've got to become involved in this cause. My government is, you know, knee deep in the blood of Palestinians with its lavish support of uh, this apartheid state. Um, and so I decided, you know, uh, in 2015 or 2016, I had to go to Israel for work. Uh, I was uh, at that time prosecuting a case against a Canadian gold mining company that had used slave labor in Eritrea in Eastern Africa. And a lot of the slave laborers it had, whom it had exploited had fled the country and ended up in Tel Aviv. Uh, that we found that out through our research. So we contacted them and I went to Tel Aviv to interview them to gather evidence for this case. And when I was done my work, I was invited to the West Bank by a Palestinian Canadian friend of mine who was in Bethlehem at the time. And she took me on a tour of the West Bank. And I interviewed Palestinians in Hebron, in East Jerusalem, in Bethlehem, and in farming communities outside of Bethlehem, and was so, uh, I guess, devastated is the only word I could find by what I heard and saw that when I came back to Canada in 2016, I decided to bring forward a resolution in the Green Party of Canada calling for the party to support BDS. And from the moment I did that, uh, I encountered uh, intense opposition from the leader of the Green Party at the time, Elizabeth May, who told me under no circumstances she, could she support a policy you know, calling for the party to uh, endorse the BDS movement. Uh, frankly, all the explanations she gave me, to the extent she gave me any, were incoherent. Uh, they made no sense to me. I didn't understand how they could possibly be consistent with the core values of the Green Party, which include nonviolence and uh, you know, respect for diversity. Um, and so I decided over her objections to persevere and, um, and to advocate for that resolution at our biannual convention in Ottawa in August of 2016. Uh, and when we got there, to be blunt about it, I thought I was going to lose because Elizabeth May was wildly popular. She was our only MP, and she made it very clear she was going to oppose my resolution. So we got up on the convention floor, and we had a debate. And to my great astonishment, uh, a large majority of the delegates who were present voted in favor of the resolution. The next day, Elizabeth May went on national television and threatened to resign. Uh, unbeknownst to me, that's the tactic she had employed in the past to get her way. Uh, but uh, having issued this threat on national television, the federal counsel of the party became deeply concerned that we were about to lose our, own, our only MP and our leader. So they hastily organized another convention. This was unprecedented in the history of the party to take place three months later in Calgary where they were gonna revisit this resolution. And the obvious objective was to pressure the party's members into uh, rejecting what they had adopted in August. Uh, and I, I viewed that as being profoundly anti-democratic. Uh, so at that point, um, I had just retired from the full-time practice of law, so I had the time on my hands to do this. I embarked on a cross-country uh, tour to defend the resolution, a speaking tour in 16 cities uh, with the, the, the assistance of, you know, dozens of conscientious activists from around the country, including uh, activists at Independent Jewish Voices, Canadians for Justice and Peace in the Middle East. And um, by the time we got to the convention in December, the second convention, I think uh, it was clear that uh, this attempt to gut our resolution wasn't going to succeed. And so we managed to negotiate uh, a so-called compromise resolution, which in substance was stronger from the Palestinian perspective than the first resolution, but it didn't contain the dreaded acronym BDS. So we made a cosmetic concession in order to gain uh, a number of substantive concessions. So for example, uh, the resolution called for the new resolution, the compromise called for Israel to be hauled before the International Criminal Court for War Crimes. Uh, the first resolution said nothing about that. 
Um, and it called for sanctions on the arms industry in Israel. It called for uh, the use of divestment uh, to economically penalize companies that were complicit in the occupation. There was a whole bunch of new stuff in there, but we just took out the acronym BDS. And uh, I think it was kind of, to be perfectly blunt about it, it was kind of like a face-saving measure for Elizabeth May, because at that point, I think she was, she saw the writing on the wall and she realized that her attempt to gut the resolution was going to fail. And of course, throughout all of this, the last thing I'll say about throughout all of this, all of the, uh, I and everybody else who was closely associated with this resolution were relentlessly smeared as anti-Semites and supporters of terrorism uh, by the Israel lobby and by a handful of uh, pro-Israel Greens in the Green Party, uh, even though they, they constituted a very small proportion of the membership, they were extremely vocal and extremely aggressive and therefore had a bit of an outsized influence on party policy. But at the end of the day, we prevailed. And, uh, and it was one of the things that I think really kind of endeared me to the Green Party, is that the membership stood by that resolution. Right. So unfortunately, you got removed as the Green Party's justice critic in September 2016. This was after Andrew Weaver attacked the hard-won policy change from the conventions that year. So in one of the interviews, I think it was actually for the Green Party in 2020, uh, you said you joined the NDP for a time before returning to the Green Party. Can you take us through that time in the NDP and what eventually prompted you to return to the Greens? Well, um, so I had had this, um, you know, falling out with Elizabeth May. I'd been expelled from the uh, shadow cabinet of the Green Party of Canada because I had um, uh, responded publicly to Andrew Weaver's attacks. And by the way, I want to say about Andrew Weaver, you know, everything that I said about Andrew Weaver turned out to be true. Uh, you know, he ended up quitting the Green Party of BC. He was he is viciously attacked. Uh, the current leader of the BC Green Party and the overall political orientation. He effectively endorsed the Liberal Party so-called climate plan in the last election. I think he's made an embarrassment out of himself and every criticism I've ever uttered by, about that man, I stand by. And, and one of the criticisms that I uttered about him back in 2017, after I had this falling out with Elizabeth May, was that he was openly uh, courting um, the Liberal government of Christy Clark and was, you know, making noises about forming a coalition with her right-wing neoliberal, um, you know, anti-environment party in BC at the time. Uh, and I criticized him for this. At that point, Elizabeth May uh, became extremely upset with me uh, that I was being publicly critical of, uh, of Andrew Weaver. And, uh, and a leadership contest opened up in the NDP and somebody whom I respect in Canadian politics, uh, who I think would make a a very good leader of any political party, namely Nikki Ashton, entered the race. Uh, so at that point, I joined the NDP to support Nikki Ashton's leadership bid. And if, if Nikki had won, in all probability, I would have remained within the NDP. But she lost to, to Jagmeet Singh, unfortunately. And, you know, that party ended up remaining firmly ensconced in the uh, neoliberal Canadian political establishment. Uh, so I. I kind of was, I left that party and was on political wilderness for a while and ended up gravitating back to the Green Party. All right, so now 2020 comes around and you've announced a run for the Green Party leadership. So really, I would say, take us through this run, right? How did it come to be? What were some of the big things that happened? And then what do you think ended up leading to the narrow leadership defeat? Because you were very close, right? You came very close to that. Well, uh, I... Uh, you know, after the, exp the experience of Nikki Ashton, I, I thought Nikki, you know, it, it, when I joined uh, to support Nikki, Jugmeet Singh was not yet in the race. It was basically between Nikki and Char uh, Charlie Angus. And then, you know, Jugmeet Singh, he was with the Ontario NDP at the time, par parachutes into the race and suddenly, you know, uh, takes the thing and quickly establishes, you know, shortly into his tenure as the new NDP leader that it's going to be business as usual. Uh, you know, no radical departures from the uh, pathetic era of Tom Mulcair. Um, and so uh, I looked across the political landscape. There's no really, you know, truly left-wing radical in Canadian politics today who has any kind of authority. 
So I thought, uh, you know, when the leadership of the Green Party opened up, maybe this is an opportunity for something like that to happen. Maybe I could, you know, um, you know, provide to the uh, the left, the anti-imperialist move in this country, a voice in Canada's parliament if I sought the leadership of the Green Party. But frankly, I was very reluctant to do that uh, because I kind of had formed the impression that politics in this country are a cesspool. And I really didn't want to get into that mess. And so uh, I had heard that somebody by the name of Anime Paul had entered the leadership race. I had never heard of Anime Paul before. Um, you know, uh, but the little that I was able to glean from her, about her from the public domain, there was very little information about her, you know, in the public domain, uh, caused me to be intrigued. And I thought to myself, you know, so here's, you know, here's a black Jewish woman who appears to be progressive. Uh, hopefully she's not only progressive, but radical and anti-imperialist in her political orientation. You know, I would prefer to support her uh, than enter politics myself. And so I reached out to her. Uh, before I entered the race with the hope that she would, you know, convince me that I should just support her. And uh, to my astonishment, she refused to talk to me. And she didn't tell me why. Uh, but subsequently, I pretty much figured out why. And the reason why is because I had been an ardent advocate for Palestinian rights. I had been very critical of people who were pro-Israel in this country. And enemy, as it turns out, I didn't know this at the time, uh, but I think one can say in retrospect that she was definitely uh, pro-Israel in her orientation. Uh, and so when she refused to talk to me at that point, I mean, I was like, I couldn't really assume that she was the kind of candidate that I think the Canadian political scene needed. I didn't see anybody else entering the race who had that kind of political orientation. So reluctantly, I decided to enter the race. Uh, and I knew that I was going to get a lot of heat, particularly from Elizabeth May and those who support her uh, because of our history. Um, I didn't expect to win. I didn't expect to come anywhere close to winning. Uh, but I thought that at least I might be able to change the political conversation and create a space for future candidates to come forward uh, who had a radical agenda, uh, a left-wing radical agenda. Um, and to my great surprise, uh, you know, uh, I almost won. Uh, that too, is I was even more surprised by that than, you know, the the fact that the BDS resolution passed over Elizabeth May's objections. And I really don't think, you know, Aiden, that this is any kind of like, it, it, this is not a, in any way, shape or form, a commentary on me. It's a commentary on the politics for which I advocated. The politics for which I have advocated are very appealing to a majority of Canadians. You know, they really want, they, there's a hunger in the Canadian electorate for this type of politics. And any candidate who comes forward and who, uh, you know, sincerely, sincerely and passionately espouses these views is going to find a lot of support. Uh, you know, the problem that that candidate is going to confront is that the system is constructed in such a way as to crush any leftist who tries to enter electoral politics, notwithstanding, you know, the public's appetite for these types of politics. Uh, you know, it's just it's just the reality. Uh, you know, the, the, every single political party in this country has set up a kind of filtrage system. The NDP has done it, the Liberals have done it, which prevent somebody who is an advocate for a radical left-wing and anti-imperialist agenda to get anywhere close to power. And it's really, really hard to overcome that system. Right, so Anime Paul ends up resigning as the leader of the Green Party in late 2021. You had many Greens and left-leaning people calling for you to run again for the party leadership. What led you to decide against running again? Uh, well, uh, I mean, I, I think it's hard for me to explain that without talking about what, at least from my perspective, happened during those two years from 2020 when I ran to 2022, when I had to make a decision whether to run again. Um, I saw, you know, from my own perspective, a, a sea change in the public discourse in this country. Uh, it. It, there was the, the, the level of censorship, the inability to talk about issues in a candid way. Uh, I'd never seen anything like it before in my lifetime. And I knew that in that, you know, kind of intellectually stifling political environment, mm -hmm. somebody with my views was going to get vilified and would probably prove to be a non-viable candidate. 
Uh, and the one issue that really stood out for me, you know, was Ukraine. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm absolutely gobsmacked to this very day at the level of propaganda and censorship we're seeing around this whole issue of the Ukraine war. What caused it? What's happening in Ukraine? Where this is leading us? I've never seen this level of McCarthyism. I've never seen this level of closed mindedness, including amongst people who identify as being left wing. And I knew that if I, you know, if I wanted to be true, if I wanted to tell, you know, people what I really believe about these issues, uh, I would not be, I believed I would not be viable as a political candidate because that's the kind of, you know, political environment in which sadly we now live. So that was one reason I had to make a choice between being true to myself and running for political office. And I chose the former. Um, the other reason, frankly, was that, you know, by the time we got to 2022, the Green Party was an absolute train wreck. You know, the one year of office, Annamie Paul's, and, and let's be clear, Annamie Paul was Elizabeth May's preferred candidate. She even admitted this. Elizabeth admitted this in a Toronto Star op-ed op after Annamie Paul resigned. And the reason why Elizabeth admitted that she supported Annamie was not, uh, in my opinion, in order to clear her conscience. The reason why she admitted it is because Annamie's supporters were attacking Elizabeth and saying that she had undermined Annamie Paul's leadership. So in order to defend herself, Elizabeth finally came clean and told the Toronto Star and the public, oh, actually, I supported Annamie during the leadership contest, which she did. And she did it despite having declared before the leadership contest in 2020 began that she had to be, as she put it, completely neutral as the former leader. She just completely disregarded that commitment, supported Annamie, uh, lied about the fact that she had supported Anime and ultimately admitted that she had supported Anime in order to defend herself from uh, attacks by Anime's supporters. All of this, you know, and I don't need to get into the gruesome details of it, was devastating to the Green Party. Uh, we lost a lot of support, uh, a lot of funding. Uh, our, the number of MPs we had in Parliament dropped down to two uh, from three. Uh, and the party was a mess. And, you know, uh, not, it, it's, I think it's quite telling. It's not just me who didn't run in 2022. None of the other people uh, who ran in 2020, 2020 ran in 2022. I think all of us collectively, whatever our differences may be politically, I think we all understood to some extent or another that, you know, Elizabeth May's preferred candidate and her meddling, her incessant meddling in the affairs of the Green Party had devastated the party. Right. So the point you raised about Ukraine, I want to get into that. So obviously the biggest foreign policy story in Canada and the world continues to be Russia's special military operation in Ukraine. What is your view on that? Well, the, the, my number one message to my fellow Canadians and anybody out there who is willing to listen is that we are on uh, a trajectory which not only might end in nuclear war, in my opinion, it is very likely to end a nuclear war. Uh, the Russian government has made it absolutely crystal clear that it regards this war as an existential threat. I don't think they're joking. <laughs> I think they are telling the truth. Well, you can disagree about whether it actually is an existential threat to Russia, but that's what they believe. And there's no reason to doubt them. And in fact, they have plenty of reason to believe that, given the way the West has behaved in places like Serbia and, and Iraq and, you know, Libya and Syria and on and on. Uh, and, you know, and, and the fact that the U.S. government withdrew in 2004 from the anti-ballistic missile treaty, and then Trump withdrew in 2018 from the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, and Trump withdrew from the nuclear deal with Iran, even though the IAEA certified, certified that Iran was complying with the deal. Every single indicator is that NATO is an, an, an extraordinarily aggressive military alliance and that it's willing to use, as the United States did, for example, at the end of the Second World War, nuclear weapons to achieve its nefarious agenda. And so the Russians view this quite understandably as an existential threat and they have enough nukes to destroy the world many times over. This is happening on the border a few hundred miles from Moscow. And every time it appears that the Russians are winning, we escalate. And they respond by uh, with, you know, for example, after we blew up the, undoubtedly the Kerch Bridge, which connected mainland Russia to Crimea, was blown up with the assistance of the West a few months ago. And they warned 
the West. The Russians said, this is a red line. And sure enough, after uh, they blew up the Kerch Bridge, what did Russia do? It began systematically destroying the power grid in Ukraine. It had refrained from doing that for months, even though Iraq suffered that very fate at the very outset of the illegal invasion of Iraq. And we did the same thing in Serbia. We immediately began in, it began destroying dual use infrastructure in those countries. Russians didn't do that. They waited for several months. They did it as a reaction to the destruction of the Kerch or the, the, the damage to the Kerch bridge. And, uh, you know, and now we are escalating again. What are we doing now? Now we're sending main battle tanks. Many of the Western governments said they weren't going to do that. Now we're talking about sending F-16s. We're talking about sending long range missiles, which can strike deep into Russia. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to see where this all ends. This is going to end in a nuclear holocaust. And I say to every single person out there on the left, uh, in the climate movement, whatever it is that your, you know, your passion may be directed to right now, you need to put that aside and you need to focus your attentions on this war because the way things are going, we will not survive beyond 2023. There is a serious risk that there will be a nuclear holocaust within the next 12 months. Nothing matters more right now than bringing this war to an end. Now, I could go on and on about other reasons why this war should be of concern to you, but that alone, that alone should be cause enough for us to prioritize the resolution of this war. So I want to ask how you assess Russia's stated aim of uh, denazification and demilitarizing Ukraine. Well, you know, it, it, I, I, what I'm about to say is, you know, undoubtedly going to be perceived by a lot of people in our society who've been thoroughly brainwashed as, you know, Russian propaganda. But the fact of the matter is that there is a serious problem with Nazism in Ukraine. And this was a problem which the Western media were openly acknowledging for a number of years before the, uh, the invasion began in February of last year. All of a sudden, when the invasion began, it became forbidden to talk about it. But you can go back and you can find reports in The Guardian and the BBC and The Washington Post and The New York Times from 2014, 2015, which openly acknowledge the serious problem with Nazism in Ukraine. And I'll give you one fact which should leave no doubt in anybody's mind about how serious a problem this is in Ukraine. In late 2018, the Ukrainian parliament declared a national holiday, a national holiday in, to, to honor the legacy of Stepan Bandera. Stepan Bandera was a Nazi collaborator, a co-founder of an ultra-right nationalist party in Ukraine that was responsible for the massacre of tens of thousands of Poles, Jews, and Russians. And when this year, on January 1st, they held their, uh, you know, decrepit uh, national holiday in Ukraine in honor of this neo-Nazi mass murderer, Stepan Bandera, the Polish government was so offended and few states in the West have been as supportive of Ukraine as the Polish government, that they came out and publicly condemned the Ukrainian government for celebrating the legacy of Bandera. I mean, that fact alone, that this is, you know, and Putin gave a speech um, a few months ago in which he said something which I, I think which is entirely fair. He said, you know, we have a problem with ultranationalism in Russia. There's no question we have a problem. The difference between us and Ukraine is we don't elevate them to the status of national hero these people. But in Ukraine, they do. And that's something that sets the problem of Nazism apart from, you know, other uh, countries in the West, which all to varying degrees or another have a problem with the far right and neo-Nazism. It's everywhere, unfortunately, and alarmingly. But in Ukraine, my God, it's taken on uh, truly frightening proportions. So the Russians are entirely justified, especially after what they suffered in the Second World War, you know, losing tens of millions of their own citizens. Uh, to the Nazi scourge, uh, to, to be, feel threatened by this. And I think they're entirely justified in saying, we want to see a government in Ukraine that is going to deal effectively with the problem of neo-Nazism. Uh, and as far as demilitarization is concerned, you know, we basically created a de facto NATO army in Ukraine for between 2014 and 2022. I mean, the Ukrainian army grew to be one of the largest armies in Europe during that time. It was armed to the teeth. It had hundreds of thousands of soldiers. It was building deep, powerful fortifications uh, in the Donbass and was placing artillery systems on the Ukrainian side of those fortifications in order to bombard Donetsk. And it was killing thousands of people, Ukrainians living on the other side of the contact line in the Donbass. 
So again, I understand completely why the Russians would want to demilitarize Ukraine. I understand completely why they complain about NATO expanding up to its borders after, you know, NATO powers told Gorbachev in the 90s that they would not expand NATO one inch eastward. They repeatedly flouted that promise. You know, the fact of the matter is that some of the stuff that the Russian government is saying to justify what it's done, even if you disagree that the war was justified and illegal, the complaints that they're articulating and which motivated them to do what they did uh, are entirely legitimate, in my view. And we should have tried to address those complaints in a peaceful manner. This was an entirely avoidable war. Entirely avoidable. It was unnecessary, whether it's illegal or legal. You know, and I've said, I've gone through uh, on my website, I've written an article in which I conducted a legal analysis. I think, pro and I've taken the position that probably this war is a violation of the UN Charter. But that doesn't stop us as responsible citizens from recognizing our own role, our own government's nefarious role in this catastrophe that has befallen the Ukrainian people and that now threatens the existence of humanity itself. We played a very nefarious role in all of this, and we're not going to solve this problem without recognizing that. So uh, leading on to this, uh, is a neutral Ukraine the best way out of the conflict? And if so, how can this neutrality be really accomplished? Uh, well, it's, I would say it's an essential component of a resolution, but I think we're now way beyond that. You know, I think it was very clear early in the war, there were peace negotiations in Turkey early in the war. Uh, and the reports that I've seen, they, they came close to an agreement. The reports that I've seen um, didn't involve um, or require Ukraine to make any uh, territorial concessions to Russia. But Ukraine was on the verge of agreeing that it would remain neutral and not become part of NATO. And the Ukrainian press reported that uh, the British government, at that time led by Boris Johnson, torpedoed the deal. That he went to Kiev when they were on the cusp, the Russians and the, the, the Ukrainians of doing this deal and told them, you know, we aren't going to support this deal. And furthermore, if you um, continue fighting this war, we're going to arm you to the teeth and we're going to help you uh, win and prevail in the end. And the puppet Zelensky went along with all of this to the detriment of the Ukrainian people. Now what's happened is that this war has been repeatedly escalated. Uh, the Russians have undoubtedly lost thousands and perhaps tens of thousands of soldiers. They have been subjected to a punishing re sanctions regime. And at this stage, I don't think the Russians would be satisfied with uh, that commitment, a commitment of neutrality. You know, they would have been satisfied potentially back in February and March of last year, but we. We blew that deal up. And now we have to deal with the fact that the Russians are going to demand more. Uh, so is Ukrainian neutrality an essential component of a peace deal? Yes. Uh, but I think at this stage, we have to accept that the Russians are going to require territorial concessions on top of Ukrainian neutrality. And what does Ukrainian neutrality look like? It looks like this. You know, Ukraine can have its own army. I mean, this is certainly how I would envision it. Ukraine can have its own domestic military force, uh, but it cannot host uh, NATO forces on its soil. It certainly can't be a base for any NATO missiles, conventional or otherwise. Uh, it can't be uh, part of a, an arrangement which contains an Article 5-like guarantee that if Ukraine is attacked, uh, you know, uh, the entirety of NATO is going to go after its attacker. Uh, and at the same time, the Russians are going to have to get, you know, withdraw their military forces from whatever parts of Ukraine remain within the sovereign state of U Ukraine after this war and, you know, provide guarantees that they aren't going to uh, try to acquire any more territory or station their forces uh, beyond uh, the mutually agreed limits of Ukraine. Uh, and I think that, you know, if I were in the Ukrainian pos uh, position, I would be demanding loudly reparations. Uh, and they don't even have to call it reparations. They can call it a reconstruction fund, call it whatever you want. But Russia has the financial capacity to help Ukraine rebuild. And it should do that without any doubt, as should the West, because we also bear responsibility for this war. Russia and the Western states together should put together a reconstruction fund, fund for Ukraine and make that country into a more prosperous country than it's ever been. It was the poorest country in Europe before this war. And at this stage, it's an absolutely devastated uh, country. 
Uh, it's a failed state, in fact, and the only reason why it continues to function is because of Western support. So initially, you know, many people in Canada, including many of those on the left or even self-described anti-imperialists, were caught off guard by Russia's SMO beginning and joined in the rush to condemn it, though experts like John Mersheimer and others had warned that US NATO actions in Ukraine would have dire consequences. Not all rushed to condemn the SMO as Canada Falls endorsed a Hamilton coalition to stop the war statement on February 25th, 2022, firmly putting the fault of the situation on NATO and Ukraine and not seeking to dictate to Russia how it should deal with crisis level threats. How has your view about the SMO evolved since it was launched on February 24th, 2022? And if it has evolved, pinpoint like the moments and the events that prompted views to evolve. Okay, well, that's a you know very good question. As I mentioned at the very outset, two days after the SMO began, uh, so this would have been late February of last year, uh, I I looked at uh, the situation. I'm I'm a lawyer, and I have significant you know familiarity with international law. This has always been an area of passionate interest to me. Uh, so, bringing to bear my experience as a lawyer with uh, you know knowledge of international law, I I analyzed the situation and I came to the conclusion that the war, uh, that the invasion probably was a violation of the UN Charter. Uh, I have to be honest, and I'm not so sure that that's true anymore. And I think what I really began to reevaluate was, I saw an interview with Norman Finkelstein, um, and he was asked about the legality of this himself. And I, although I don't believe, you know, Professor Finkelstein is a lawyer, he's very sophisticated about these things. And, and he said he asked a simple question for which I did not have an answer. And the simple question is, what was the Russians supposed to do? Uh, you know, they tried to negotiate over and over again. Uh, they entered into the Minsk Accords. Uh, the Ukrainian government flouted the Minsk Accords, as has been documented, by the way, by um, an American academic, Nikolai Petro, who was recently interviewed by Aaron Mate. He's written a book about this. And uh, after, after, you know, listening to uh, Professor Petro talk about this, and by the way, he used to be an advisor on the Soviet Union for the U.S. State Department. So he knows a thing or two about this part of the world. And it's very clear that the Ukrainians flouted the Minsk Accords and that Poroshenko had no intention whatsoever of complying with the Minsk Accords. And then, of course, when we get to late 2021, uh, Putin presented to uh, Biden a framework, uh, actually a drafted treaty uh, for a new security arrangement in Europe that Russia could live with. And frankly, I think that treaty would have been beneficial for the security of all Europeans. Um, and the Americans just refused to negotiate, refused, flatly refused. And so if you're looking at it from the Russian perspective, you've made repeated efforts to negotiate some kind of a mutually acceptable security arrangement within Ukraine and in Europe more broadly, and you're constantly being rebuffed and you see, uh, you know, thousands of people who are ethnically Russian and Russian speaking in the southeastern part of Europe, Ukraine being killed by the Ukrainian military. And you fear that the Americans are going to move in there with missiles a few hundred miles from Moscow. You know, I don't really have an answer to Professor Finkelstein's question. I can't come up with one. What else were they going to do? Were they supposed to go to the UN, where the United States and France and Britain would have undoubtedly vetoed any uh, resolution put forward on the security Security Council that, you know, dealt adequately with Russia's security concerns. I don't know what other option they had. Uh, and then the other thing that I found out after I wrote that article in late February was that in the weeks leading up to the SMO, the commencement of the SMO, there had been a dramatic increase in the shelling of the Donbass uh, by Ukrainian forces, which, you know, to a lot of military professionals might have looked uh, like a precursor to an invasion, uh, to the heavily built up Ukrainian forces. Zelensky also, I didn't know this at the time I wrote that article, Zelensky was uh, saying unequivocally that they were gonna retake Crimea by force, even though for a long time Crimea historically belonged to Russia and it's crystal clear that a majority of people in Crimea wanna be part of Russia and want nothing to do with the government in Kiev. And he was even making noises about getting Ukraine nuclear weapons. Uh, and you put all of that together with, you know, the rise of neo-Nazism in Ukraine and the fact that neo-Nazis in, had infiltrated the Ukrainian government and the military and were using violence and threats of violence to pursue their agenda in Ukraine. Um, you know, it's hard for me 
to come up with, uh, you know, a condemnation of Russia's decision to act uh, militarily. Um, so I'm not so sure anymore, Aiden. I don't know. I mean, uh, I think that Russia has a plausible argument that, in fact, it had no alternative and that this is a lawful intervention. I could see, you know, if we were in front of an international court, I could see the argument going the other way. Uh, I don't think it's black and white anymore. You know, it's, it's a difficult, complex legal issue. And one thing is for sure, I challenge anybody to come up with uh, a plausible, credible answer to Norman Finkelstein's question. I think you would be hard pressed to do that if you're being objective and honest. Sure. Well, I mean, when the kind of follows myself and others were, were looking at it, we also, we really immediately came to the question of what else could freely be done. Um, and also, I kept a close eye on the statements of the Communist Party of the Russian Federation, because they went, they've gone through so much in the past couple of decades, past two or three, especially with the fall of the Soviet Union and finding ways to survive. When they came in favor of it, that was a strong influence. Um, that was very much a strong influence on it on the camp, on the camp side and my settings. So getting on to the next question, let's shift around to a bit more, well, still a recent event. Uh, the spate of attacks against Iran. Do you think those bring us to a larger conflict and how concerned are you about a potential second front? Well, I think we, you know, the, the, the French anthropologist Emmanuel Todd, one of the most respected intellectuals in France, just published a book. Uh, if, if I recall correctly, the, it, the title is World War III Has Begun. Uh, I believe that that's exactly what's happened. We are in a world war. And, you know, we're not calling it, the, well, the, you know, back in the Second World War, they weren't calling it the Second World War in the early stages of the war. This was a judgment that history made subsequently. And I think when historians look back at what's happening now, especially if we continue down this path, they will say that this is a world war. Uh, and it's, it's already spiraled beyond the borders of Ukraine. There are attacks taking place in Russia. Uh, the uh, Nord Stream pipeline was blown up, almost certainly by one or more NATO states. Um, you are seeing now in Iran, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I wouldn't exclude the possibility that Ukraine is actually involved in some way in that attack. Uh, that they, they, this is some kind of retaliatory attack because it's believed that the Iranians have been helping the Russians with drones. Uh, certainly, I think the prime suspect is Israel. Uh, and Israel has long uh, and openly, loudly advocated for war on Iran. Uh, by the way, that's absolutely outrageous because the Iranians don't have any nukes. Uh, and the CIA itself said back in 2003 that the Iranian government was not trying to develop a nuclear arsenal, whereas Israel does have a nuclear arsenal. And not only that, it's the only state in the Middle East that hasn't signed on to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. So it's ridiculous that this apartheid state is lecturing other states in the Middle East about their non-existent you know, nuclear weapons programs. Uh, but uh, whatever you may think about that, the fact is that Israel has been very clear on record that it wants war on Iran. So who's capable of doing this and who has the motivation to do it? Very, very likely Israel. And Israel, I think, uh, it, you know, is cynical enough, its government is cynical enough to say, this is a pretty good time for us to do it because the world is distracted by what's going on in Ukraine. And a lot of people are upset with Iran in the West because, you know, allegedly Iran has been helping the Russians. Um, and also this would be, you know, I think the Americans would look at a war in the Middle East right now uh, as being uh, an additional burden on Russia. Uh, you know, this would be, uh, this would undoubtedly divert the attention and the resources of the Russian government and military. They have a naval base in Syria. Uh, they have significant interests in the Middle East that they want to protect. Uh, so yeah, this, this could be, you know, the next stage of the expansion of this war. Uh, and I think also in Eastern Europe, uh, if we continue to, you know, um, uh, deliver weapons from Western Europe into Ukraine, and those weapons become ever more destructive uh, and difficult for the Russians to uh, defend themselves from, uh, we are greatly escalating the chance that there are going to be attacks on military facilities in NATO states by the Russian military. I could easily see the Russians in the next several months saying, we've had enough, you know, we're going to attack uh, military installations in Poland because Poland is sending soldiers over, they're sending weapons, they are actually repairing the weapons that get damaged on the Ukrainian battlefield and then sending them back across the border to kill Russians. It's entirely conceivable that there, we will have a hot war in uh, European, European, certain of Europe's NATO members within the next several months. 
And certainly in terms of the question of potentially being at World War III uh, already, I mean, certainly the censorship on uh, Russian media is really uh, reminiscent of wartime censorship. In, in my view, there's there's more stuff I have to say about that, but um, I'll pick the time that's right to talk about that another time. Uh, anyways. And by the way, Anna Berlock, uh, Germany's green foreign minister, supposedly green foreign minister, just came right out and told the European Parliament a few, day, a few days ago that Europe's at war with Russia. Just came right out and said it. You know, at least she has the decency and honesty to say that, whereas, you know, our pathetic government won't actually admit the Canada is at war with Russia. You know, we just say we're supporting Ukraine. We are at war with Russia by any rational definition of at war. Uh, and Canadians need to understand that. Yes, it really is. It really is the case. So next question I want to get on to you with. So the situation in China's Taiwan province, they are really trying to ramp up there, seemingly trying to instigate a similar conflict to what's going on in Ukraine. Canada has really eagerly joined the U.S. in prodding and attacking China. How should Canadian foreign policy towards China be changed? Uh, well, we should uh, absolutely refuse to participate in any kind of belligerent uh, military maneuvers in the South China Sea or in any part of, you know, uh, Southeast Asia. We have sent uh, naval vessels through the South China Sea. We are taking part in this fraudulent, you know, um, <laughs> uh, uh, effort or you know this this what what's described fraudulently by the canadian government government as an effort to ensure that the sanctions on north korea are being respected what we do is we send surveillance aircraft uh into the south china sea areas bordering china and we tell the chinese that this is being done in order to ensure that the sanctions are being respected with north korea when i think the chinese quite rightly look at this as at least in part an effort to spy on China's military installations, and they have repeatedly sent up fighter jets to intercept these Canadian surveillance aircraft. It's a very dangerous situation. Uh, we should get the hell out of there. Uh, you know, if our military is actually defensive in nature, then it should be confined entirely, entirely to the territory of Canada. We should not be, assuming we should have any military at all, and there's a legitimate question about whether we even need a military, but let's assume we do, we should have a constitutional requirement that those military forces will be stationed ex exclusively on our territory and our territorial waters, absent a formal declaration of war by parliament. Short of a formal declaration of war by parliament after a fulsome debate, we should never allow our military assets to go abroad. There's absolutely no excuse for that. And that's where we deploy them mostly. We put them in places like not just the South China Sea, we put them in Afghanistan, we put them in Iraq, you know, we put them in uh, the Mediterranean, we put them in Eastern Europe, we put them in the Baltic states. How is that defending Canada? That's, that's exposing Canadians to a risk of nuclear war. And in fact, I would go so far as to say that the Canadian government has put a nuclear bullseye on the back of every single Canadian today by pursuing these extraordinarily belligerent and provocative uh, maneuvers in concert with the American military forces. So we got to get out of the South China Sea, number one. Number two, we shouldn't be imposing any sanctions of any nature on China unless we are prepared to apply the principles underlying those sanctions universally. And that would mean that we would be sanctioning the United States because there's no country in the world today that is less respectful of international law, more abusive of human rights, more subversive of democracy and democratic movements than the United States government. And if we're not prepared to apply the same penalties to the United States hegemon as we would apply to others who we say are violating human rights or international law, then we shouldn't do it whatsoever. We're just discrediting ourselves. And we're proving ourselves to be uh, uh, you know, uh, dishonest actors on the international stage. And the last thing is we should offer our services as a mediator. You know, this is what Canada, this is can we aren't big enough. Uh, powerful enough, and we never will be, uh, you know, to sort of become, and nor should we aspire to be, the policemen of the world. What we can do as a country, and we can make an enormous contribution in this respect, is be a truly neutral arbiter of disputes. Uh, and that requires us to listen to all sides. It requires us to refrain from provocative actions. Uh, it requires us to be scrupulously respectful of international institutions, international law. 
Uh, and that's the way in which not only we can heighten our prestige and our standing in the world, uh, but we can actually make the world a better place. That's the role for Canada. And unfortunately, it's the role that we have consistently failed to assume. Do you think there's potential in Canada potentially joining the Belt and Road Initiative? Do you think that would benefit Canadians? Oh, I think it would most definitely benefit Canadians. Uh, I think there's no doubt that the center of uh, geopolitical and economic power is shifting eastward. Uh, I think the whole world sees this outside of the West. The Middle East sees it. Africa sees it. Uh, South America sees it. Uh, and if we were you know, governed by leaders who actually were acting in the interests of our country, we would be fostering deeper economic ties with the countries of Asia, including particularly China, uh, which will have the biggest economy in the world soon and may already by some measures have the world's biggest economy. Right. So the Canada Files reporting uh, has revealed how a CIA front, the National Endowment for Democracy, has been funding Canadian groups for years. The U.S. is the world's most brutal state, an imperial state that commits genocide against indigenous peoples, brutalizes its own population, and subjects the world to its violent domination, often via funding terrorist groups. Canada is on its border and is therefore close to a very dangerous state. I have two questions around Canada-U.S. relations. First of all, CIA interference in Canadian politics. What should be done about it? Uh, what should be done about our relationship with the United States? Uh, oh, so the question of CIA interference first and then general relations with... with the question of CIA interference? Yes. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I think the first thing, that's a tough question because our country has become so deeply uh, intertwined with the U.S. economically, militarily, and politically, and culturally uh, that, you know, uh, restoring Canada to the position of a sovereign state, which we are not, is an extremely difficult undertaking. Uh, in the intelligence realm, um, I think the first thing we have to do, uh, I don't expect that this is going to happen in my lifetime, but, you know, if I could wave a magic wand, I would say we need to cut off, you know, information sharing arrangements with U.S. intelligence agencies. We need to get out of the five eyes, in particular, this white supremacist, you know, intelligence organization uh, and just strictly, you know, except in matters of in sort of conventional policing. So, for example, if you're dealing with cross-border crime, maybe there we would engage in some very limited intelligence sharing. But when it comes to geopolitics, no, we should not be involved in any intelligence sharing arrangement with the United States. Not at all. We shouldn't be giving them information. We can't trust that the Americans are going to use that information in a lawful manner. We can't trust that they're going to use that information in a manner that's to the benefit of the, Amer the Canadian people. Uh, the second thing we need to do is, you know, we have basically the, the Snowden revelations revealed that U.S. tech companies are basically conduits for spying on citizens around the world. Uh, that's what, you know, the U.S. intelligence community is using Google and uh, Facebook and so forth to do, to spy on people around the world and also the telecoms providers. Uh, so we have to find a way to put an end to that. I'm not, you know. Uh, techno technologically sophisticated enough to tell you exactly how that must be done. But uh, I have no doubt that the American government, after the revelations of, you know, the heroic Edward Snowden, is spying extensively on people all over the West, including in Canada. And we shouldn't delude ourselves about that. Um, so we have to find a way to bring that to an end. Uh, I think we got to get out of NATO without question. I think we need to get out of NORAD. You know, and something people, people will hear these things and they'll say, wow, you know, this guy's, you know, he's off the charts. He's saying maybe we shouldn't have a military and we shouldn't send our military abroad. And we've got to get out of NATO. We've got to get out of NORAD. And stop intelligence sharing. I mean, I think people need to step back and look at a map. <laughs> Just take a look at a map. Who is going to invade Canada? Who has the capacity to actually threaten this country with a military invasion? And and even if there's a country out there that could do it, that could, you know, launch an invasion of this country and logistically maintain an occupation of a significant part of Canadian territory, anybody with half a brain knows that the Americans would never tolerate that. They would never tolerate, for example, Russian military forces on their northern border or Chinese military forces on their northern border. We don't even need to have a security treaty with the United States. The mere fact that we lie to the north of the United States is a huge deterrent 
a huge deterrent to any foreign military power trying to attack Canada or uh, occupy some part of this country. It's just a practical reality. We are protected by formidable natural barriers and by our proximity to the United States. Well, what, so about, what about this, though? Because we've had, you know, I think you've seen Tucker Carlson talk about, you know, invading Canada and some of these weird e-celebrity types on the left as well, echoing that claim. So what about the threat of U.S. Uh, oh, well, invasion? that's a totally different ball of wax. I mean, you know, I'm talking about the threats that the conventional, uh, that we hear about in the conventional mm-hmm. discourse. Right. We hear about Russia and China. I think this is laughable. They're not, they've not threatened us. They have no desire to invade Canada. I don't think they, even if they had that desire, I don't think they could get away with it. They think they realize the United States would, would react extremely uh, violently to anything of that nature. And so that's not a threat. Is the United States a threat? Absolutely, the United States is the threat. Uh, if that is the primary threat to Canadian sovereignty and the well-being of the Canadian people. Let's not kid ourselves. You know, the United States, if it runs out of water, does anybody doubt for one second that it's going to look northward to our our abundant freshwater resources? If the United States is getting low on oil, does anybody doubt that it's going to use whatever means it judges to be necessary to be able to access our fossil fuels? And what are we going to do to stop it at the end of the day? Do we even have the capacity to stop it? Those are legitimate concerns. Those are legitimate questions that we should be talking about. This idea that we should be worried about Russia invading, you know, Canada or China invading is laughable. If anybody threatens us, it's the United States. You've hit the nail on the head. And yet that's the discussion that you can't even have in the mainstream media. I mean, it's as if that threat doesn't even exist. Not only do we not talk about how are we going to deal with it, you know, we pretend that they, the United States doesn't threaten Canadian sovereignty or the well-being of Canadians. This is nonsense. Of course it does. All right, for sure. So I want to jump to organizing against imperialism. So we've seen Canada's UN ambassador, Bob Ray, denounce an event planned in the U.S. called Rage Against the War Machine, which calls for ending money to Ukraine, securing peace in Ukraine by willing to make concessions to Russia, disbanding NATO, ending U.S. interference in Ukraine, among other elements. Notably, these US, U.S. organizers chose not to slip in a denouncement of Russia, instead focusing on the imperialism waged by the West against Russia and other supposed enemy nations. What steps do you believe the Canadian left would need to take to be capable of organizing such an event? Well, we first have to all, we have to grow a spine, you know, and people need to get out of their shells and start talking about the reality of this war. We have to start talking openly and honestly about the fact that our government is deeply complicit in this war, not only in the bringing it about and provoking it, uh, but also in escalating it and sustaining it. Uh, We have to have the courage to say these things. I think we have to have, above all, a determination to do what I did at the very outset of our discussion about the Ukraine war, and that is highlight the extraordinary risk of a nuclear holocaust. You know, we are sleepwalking our way to nuclear war. It's hardly even talked about here. It's amazing to me how many people I speak to on the left think that this is, you know, this is not a realistic uh, possibility that there's going to be a nuclear exchange as a result of the war in Ukraine. I think these people are delusional. As I said, I think it's not only a realistic possibility on the trajectory we're currently on, it's a likelihood. That's where this will end. It's inevitable. Uh, So we need to impress upon the Canadian people that the stakes couldn't be higher and that our government is doing the precise opposite of what it should do in order to protect the future of our country. Uh, And if we were able to have that kind of a discussion, then we would have a realistic chance of reviving the peace and movement in the in this country, whose you know services were never more needed than they are today. Sure. So, building on that, uh, why do you think the anti-imperialist left in Canada wasn't really struggle uh, ready for the sparking of the struggle between Western imperialism and everybody else? Because there was a big game talk, but there was this almost sense of panic and a rush to uh, come towards acceptability. Right. What are your thoughts there? Uh, I think that this is really my, you know, uh, my sense, uh, you know, I, I can't, I, I can't say that I, my, my views about this are based on anything other than sort of my gut feeling, but what I've seen over the last 20 years, I think that we have been, I think this war was a long time in the making and effectively beginning very early on, I think when Vladimir Putin first came to power back in 2000, uh, because as I recall, you know, Yeltsin, the corrupt, drunken, 
uh, you know, pro-Western neoliberal buffoon who devastated his country uh, and who frankly was really a traitor to his country, to be perfectly blunt about it. Um, you know, because Yeltsin seemed to be fine with Putin as his successor, I think in Western governments were initially hopeful that uh, a Putin government was going to be business as usual. And they would be able to continue to exploit Russia's resources, subjugate the Russian people, uh, potentially even at some point continue the dismemberment of what remained of the Soviet Union. Uh, but they found out very quickly that that that's not who Vladimir Putin is. And I think something that was really an eye opener for them was when Putin's government prosecuted Mikhail Khodorkovsky, uh, a kleptocrat uh, who had become the richest man in Russia uh, through his kleptocracy during the Yeltsin years. And he put him in jail for 10 years on fraud. He, the man basically stole, you know, extraordinarily valuable Russian state assets for a nickel and a dime. Uh, and he threw him in jail and confiscated virtually all of his wealth, transferred it to the Russian state. And I think at that point, the West suddenly, Western governments and the capitalist class in particular, woke up and realized that they weren't dealing with another Boris Yeltsin. And from that moment on, there has been a relentless propaganda campaign waged against Russia's government and um, the Russian people not just Russia's government, but Russia's people. And there's been a wholesale rewriting of history, including relatively recent history. Uh, and so what we have today in the West is a population um, which around these issues, the issues of Russia's government, the people of Russia, the society of Russia, the Ukraine war, have been intensely, relentlessly propagandized. And it is really hard to get through to people with the facts in the West. There, it is really an unprecedented propaganda campaign that has been, and, and it's also, this has been very much directed towards the Chinese government as well, and the people of China. Uh, and why, why has that happened? Because, you know, the neocons understand perfectly well that Russia and China, particularly if they are cooperating with each other, are an insurmountable, insurmountable challenge to US global hegemony. Uh, these are not two states that can be pushed around, and uh, they are absolutely determined, the neocons in the West, to perpetuate the era of U.S. global hegemony. That means they're going to have to wage hybrid war against China and Russia. In order to do that and maintain the support of the Western electorates, they will have to engage in a relentless, unprecedented campaign of propaganda. That's exactly what they've done, and they've been very effective at it. You know, people like yourself, like me, uh, like those people who are going to go to Washington, take part in that protest. We are a small minority, a vocal but small minority, who are working tirelessly to overcome uh, the effects of that propaganda. Uh, and uh, I think we're making progress. I think reality is going to intrude, ultimately, and will no longer be deniable, uh, you know, six to 12 months down the road. Uh, the question for me is not whether people will finally wake up. They will. The question for me is whether we're going to survive that long. Exactly. I couldn't agree more. So speaking of survival, really put it into perspective for people, like how urgent of a situation we're in and how much time you think uh, we'd have to avert disaster. We have no time. We have absolutely no time. This a nuclear war could break out on it. People need to understand this. A nuclear war could begin at any moment, at any moment. The, 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 the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists just put out their latest doomsday clock, uh, and it is closer to midnight. I think it's either 60 seconds or 30 seconds. I think it was 90. I think it was 90. 90. So whatever it may be, it's closer to midnight than at any time in the history of nuclear weapons, including the Cuban Missile Crisis. This is uh, an extraordinarily dangerous situation. You know, all it would take is, you know, uh, some missiles being launched from some Western European state that are mistaken by the Russians as a, a potential nuclear launch. That's all it would take. Uh, you, know, it, you know, or the Ukrainians, military forces, uh, having gotten their hands on some newfangled destructive weapon from NATO, use it to attack Moscow, you know, and kill a bunch of civilians in Moscow, try to blow up, uh, you know, some important part of the nation's capital. That's all it would take. Something like this could happen in We could have an, an accident in the Black Sea. We could have, you know, a, 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 an American AWAC, which is constantly circling the skies around Ukraine to deliver real-time battlefield intelligence to the Ukrainian military, which they then, they then use to kill Russians. 
you know, the Russians end up shooting down, maybe accidentally, maybe intentionally, an American AWAC. All of a sudden, we are into a hot war and the nuclear bombs will start flying. So we don't have any more time. This should be our highest priority. Any person of conscience who has any effort to spare, any time to spare, any energy to spare in public advocacy should be demanding that we bring this war to an end as quickly as possible and by any and all peaceful means necessary. For sure. So I want to ask, uh, so you've been critical of pro-war green parties. For example, the German foreign minister, Babercock, has gained international attention from broiling the US, the EU, deeper into the war against Russia. Yet as a result of Europe's self-enforced energy security crisis, Germany has returned to burning coal. This came despite the Greens' rosy promises of peace and ecological reforms at home. Can you run us through the basics of how a country pursuing an imperialist foreign policy at the behest of the US or just on its own destroys its own ability to improve conditions at home? Uh, well, uh, first of all, um, you know, to, 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 if you sign on to the U.S. government's mili militaristic hegemonic agenda, you are necessarily going to be devoting and diverting massive public resources to military expenditures. You know, we're now up to what, uh, I think, 32, 33 billion dollars a year in this country, uh, according to sort of conventional methods of measuring our military budget. We just uh, announced our government, not we, our government announced that it was going to spend something in the range of $19 billion on the F-35. These are planes we do not need. They don't even work properly. Uh, and they, I think, quite clearly are intended for offensive purposes, not for defense. You know, they're intended to evade radar. Well, if you're defending your own territory, do you really have a need for having, you know, super expensive military aircraft that evade radar? You evade radar when you're attacking, you want to evade radar when you're attacking another country and you don't want their air defense systems to shoot down your airplanes. That's when you need uh, those types of planes. These are offensive weapons. And the lifestyle costs, uh, life, the life cycle costs of these uh, particular weapons, I think are in the range of 75, 80 billion. And now we're talking about a bunch of surface combatant vessels uh, and the life cycle costs of those. Um, by the way, I think they, they, as I understand it, these vessels we're talking about purchasing uh, you know, will be able to uh, be, uh, provide a platform for Tomahawk missiles, again, offensive weapons. Um, this is like several hundred billion dollars. So all of this expenditure could be used to uh, solve the crisis of homelessness in this country, to alleviate mass poverty, uh, you know, to increase our increasingly stressed, uh, improve our increasingly stressed healthcare system, uh, you know, to improve our infrastructure, to retrofit our buildings so that we produce lower emissions. So we're diverting massive amounts of public money to military expenditures. So that's having detrimental impacts on, you know, the quality of life for Canadians. And also the military itself is a massive uh, source of emissions. It's exacerbating the climate crisis. And as we've seen here in Canada, we are by no means immune to the climate crisis. We are, we have felt that the, the effects of the climate crisis very severely and particularly on the West Coast in the last couple of years. Um, you know, and of course, uh, the, our militarism is destabilizing the world and creating tensions with nuclear armed states, uh, which with potentially, you know, unspeakably catastrophic consequences for all Canadians and all of humanity. Uh, so there's nothing good, frankly, nothing good coming from our complicity and uh, U.S. militarism and uh, its project of global hegemony. Uh, this is having severely detrimental impacts on Canadians already. And, uh, and those impacts are only going to get worse as time goes by. For sure. And I mean, Germany is real proof of uh, the dangers of allowing yourself to U.S. imperialism along so many other reasons. You look at the inflation crisis, cost of living, uh, yeah. energy security. I don't think uh, Canadians properly grasp that things could get very bad here. Uh, yeah. That if we continue uh, our economy inherently relying on exploitation and uh, military aggression abroad, that when the decline of U.S. imperialism comes, and that will come one way or another, we are going to be on the hook for a very, very nasty fall. Uh, and people have to uh, act before that fall comes, because we're going to be in a lot worse of a position by the time that fall occurs. So, yeah, we've our ship to the American Titanic. And sorry to interrupt, but I want to you know, thank you no for reminding me 
legislation. Uh, the RAND Corporation, which is, you know, deeply enmeshed in the U.S. military industrial complex, just came out with uh, a study about the Ukraine war, which started to make some ominous noises about it. And they recognized for the first time that uh, rampant food inflation has been greatly exacerbated by uh, the conflict in Ukraine. Um, and so, yeah, inflation is another a very important way in which uh, Western militarism is adversely impacting Canadians. So looking to the, looking to the future, so in a panel hosted by the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, you talked about Green Left Canada's plans for a People's Assembly in 2023, which would discuss the question of if a new eco-socialist party should be set up. Got two questions around that. Firstly, what does eco-socialism mean to you? Is it a firm political ideology or an almost blank canvas waiting to be written up and firmed up by a growing Canadian anti-imperialist left? Uh, I, I certainly don't think it's a blank canvas, but uh, I do think it is, uh, it's, it's a work in progress. Uh, I do think that, uh, again, this is just my view of eco-socialism. It embodies several core principles. Uh, one of them is uh, the principle of equality. Uh, and by that, I don't necessarily mean that there's, you know, exact substantive equality. What I mean by that is that each and every human being, without exception, has a reasonable opportunity to achieve his or her potential. And uh, the basic necessities are provided, if necessary, by the state to each and every human being. That means housing, health care, education, water, food, the necessities of life, are uh, readily available to every member of our society. So that's a core principle of eco-socialism. Another one, of course, is sustainability. Uh, we have an economic system that uh, at time, uh, that through, through time and in, in, in perpetuity uh, will preserve the health of the planet. And that, that economic system will, uh, will operate in harmony with the planet rather than uh, in opposition to planetary health. Uh, the third element of eco-socialism is democracy, true democracy, not this pale imitation of democracy that we have today, where, you know, uh, the, the people actually determine the course of government policy and the government uh, consistently, uh, unflinchingly acts in accordance with the popular will. And people are uh, enabled to f speak freely. Uh, there's no uh, censorship of legitimate uh, dissent. Uh, and, and minimal censorship at all. As a matter of fact, only narrow categories of hate speech, I would say, that we have a, an open, robust debate uh, and uh, true power of the people. Um, and then uh, the final element of an eco-socialist society, from my perspective, is anti-racism, that there's no discrimination whatsoever, uh, but not only on the basis of uh, you know, race, but on the basis of religion, nationality, gender, uh, sexual orientation. So anti-racism, equality, sustainability, and democracy are the four core elements of eco-socialism. Now, how that actually, you know, looks in practice, I think you, there are a number of ways you could structure a society which, you know, respect and uh, protect those core principles. You know, uh, people should be creative about these things. Uh, there shouldn't be necessarily one, uh, specific set of uh, one specific system for every society you have to adapt these core principles to the traditions and cultures of histories of particular societies around the world but as long as those four principles are being protected uh, uh, and uh, embodied in the economic and social and government systems uh, in in of the world then you would have an eco-socialist kind of society uh, you know, I, I think we need to experiment. We need to be creative. We need to make allowances for cultural differences, historical differences. Uh, but the core thing is to respect those four principles. For sure, it's very interesting to hear that. I uh, personally chiming in. I think in terms of the question of developing things here, we need to very much look very tightly into the economic conditions. Figure out, say, if we had an eco-social society what could be taken away by foreign nations, right? What, what is actually tangibly on the ground that can't be taken away? And just more broadly, the, the current conditions of the Canadian economy, and like I said, what's vulnerable, what's not? These kind of questions, the Canadian conditions need to be explored. Because as you said very correctly, 
Socialism very much relies on adaptation to the economic, material, and social factors of each individual nation. So speaking uh, around uh, the question of a potential new party, do you personally want to see a new eco-socialist party set up? And if so, what would it bring to the table and how does it avoid being a repeat of NDP slash democratic socialist quote unquote style politics? Uh, I myself am uh, ambivalent about this. Uh, you know, I, one question that we have to ask ourselves is what is more promising? What is more likely to be more effective? Um, an eco-socialist movement taking over an existing political party that already has seats in parliament or starting from scratch? And there are pluses and minuses, uh, you know, with either of those approaches. Um, so, for example, if you start a new political party, you have to build the entire infrastructure involved in, you know, galvanizing, mobilizing people politically to support a particular party. Uh, if you take over an existing party, that infrastructure is already in place. Uh, on the downside, if you take over an existing party, as I indicated earlier, you're going to be dealing with a leadership whose singular purpose is to prevent a radical agenda from ever seeing the light of day in Canada's parliament, because that's what you have in all of these political parties in parliament. Uh, so there are pluses and minuses. Um, the other question, though, is whether, you know, electoral politics holds any promise at all uh, as it's currently conducted in Canada, whether by means of an existing political party or a new one. And I personally don't know. I'm skeptical, frankly, after having run to be the leader of the Green Party and seen all that I've seen in my lifetime, that, um, you know, the, the, the electoral system in our country can accommodate uh, a truly eco-socialist uh, agenda. Uh, I tend to think more and more, I have to con confess that this country has become so um, subordinated to the US, uh, the United States oligarchy and to the agenda of the government, which ultimately serves the interests of the American oligarchy, um, that the only way we're ever gonna see an eco-socialist agenda in this country is uh, with the demise of the American empire. Only then will Canada have the sufficient freedom uh, to pursue that kind of an agenda, as long as the American empire is the world's most powerful force geopolitically. Um, it's very hard for me to imagine that, um, you know, an eco-socialist government could come to power in Canada. I don't think the Americans would allow it, to be perfectly blunt about it. It certainly is a very challenging political landscape in Canada. You know, I think along the lines of the threat of, you know, the American interference there or direct military in case of things. There's also the question of monarchy too, because they could do a similar coup to what was under uh, Gough Whitlam in Australia during the 70s. There's that risk too. But, you know, when I think about things always, I think about, you know, the, the, the working class Canadian people. I think of the Indigenous nations here that are subject to a brutal genocide. And to the people that aren't aware of the conditions and how they're being robbed and how their lives are being you know, ruined in the name, um, their own name, imperialism is being done in their name, colonialism and genocide is being done in their name. To me, I just see it as I'm, you know, you can't be sure what would happen, but I would, you know, I would rather see uh, an attempt to take it all the way, those conditions all the way to a question of an eco-socialist or a socialist government of some kind. Yeah, and then see what happens and see if it could be defended, right? Because I think there's nothing worse than the nihilism because you either give up and say, oh, this is impossible or you say, bloody hell, let's just fight to the end and let's see what happens. So well, I, I, I completely agree with you, but I, I would make two points. The first is, um, uh, it's, even if you're not convinced that uh, electoral politics holds that kind of promise at this time in Canada, that doesn't mean that you should remain silent. You know, for, for this kind of a program, an eco-socialist program to become viable in Canada, um, the precondition to that is that people are informed about what, how our society actually functions, where we're actually heading, uh, what the true agenda is of people in power, and what society could actually look like if we had honest, principled leadership in this country. So what you do, for example, like even if you don't engage ever in electoral politics, but you're involved as a journalist, a left-wing anti-imperialist journalist, doing the kind of work you're doing, you can make a huge contribution. It doesn't have to be by means of electoral politics. Uh, and the other thing I would say to you is, uh, although I'm 
skeptical because, as I say, Canada has become so deeply enmeshed in the project of American empire that, you know, we're going to see a revolution anytime soon in Canada. Uh, I think that there's, uh, there are lots of places around the world where the revolution can happen today. And in fact, it is happening in countries around the world. It's just that Canada is, because of it, its proximity to the United States and the degree to which it's become integrated into uh, the American economy polit uh, and politics and militarily, it's a particularly challenging environment to advance the project of eco-socialism. There are other places around the world where it holds much more promise in the near term. Well, no doubt, and there's no doubt it's going to be a severe challenge, but I think you and I and many others fully agree it's a fight, fight still worth fighting. Absolutely. So, so okay, so speaking of fighting and doing things uh, in the metaphorical sense, uh, what are some things that anybody watching this interview could really get going on to work to simulate the anti-imperialist movement in Canada? Um, you know, you may have seen, <laughs> I'll, I'll throw out one suggestion, which I think is very important. Uh, you know, you may have seen Aiden and others, uh, I know some others have noticed that uh, there's a group of us here in this country who uh, regularly disrupt uh, politicians when they speak publicly, and we confront them with harsh truths. I, I would recommend to my fellow Canadians that they start there. You know, when you, every time you know the politic, uh, your, your, your local MP is coming to your community or some political leaders coming to your community, go there, interrupt them and demand answers to the questions which they, they refuse to address and confront them with the facts which the media, the mainstream corporate media uh, are either minimizing or concealing altogether. Uh, you know, we should be causing people in positions of power uh, to feel extraordinarily, extraordinarily uncomfortable uh, with public appearances and public speaking. Uh, you know, there's this great story. Uh, I once uh, went to listen to a speech by Chris Hedges in Toronto at the United Church up on Bloor Street. And he told a story which apparently he, uh, he saw in the autobiography of Henry Kissinger. Uh, Kissinger and Nixon were in the White House during the protests against the Vietnam War, and there was some massive irate crowd outside the White House on the Washington Mall. And Nixon, as the story goes, turns to Kissinger and he says, Henry, they're coming to get us. <laughs> Shortly after that, uh, Nixon ended the war in Vietnam. Uh, you know, we have to strike the, I'm not talking about violence. I'm not, I'm opposed to violence in every of its manifestations, but um, they need to, you know, they need to fear us. Uh, they need to be concerned about their reputations. They need to be concerned about being embarrassed and humiliated publicly. It's gone to that point. And I, I call upon all my fellow citizens to hold these people to account publicly and to name and shame them relentlessly. That's a good place to start. Certainly, as I saw Hamilton Coalition recently do such a thing as well, I certainly hope you know, that becomes more of the regular. It's certainly a starting point for people. No doubt there. So... To wrap this up, I want to give you an opportunity to plug yourself. What should folks be on the lookout for from Dimitri Lascaris, and where should they follow you to stay on the top of latest developments? Uh, thank you for asking. I, uh, I have a website where I frequently post, uh, you know, articles that I, uh, on a variety of subjects. Most recently, I've been writing quite a bit about the Ukraine war for the reasons I've stated, but I address a number of subjects there on my website. It's DimitriLascaris.org. Uh, I also am very active on social media. Uh, you can find me at, uh, on Twitter. You know, I, I tweet 10, 15, 20 times a day uh, at Dimitri Lascaris is my Twitter handle. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I, I'm also very active uh, on Facebook and somewhat less so on Instagram. So you can find me on social media, my website. Uh, and uh, the last thing I should mention is that in the near future, I, I, uh, I'm hoping to travel to Russia. Uh, and uh, if I can uh, enter Ukraine, uh, I may do that as well. And I want to report from the ground what I see uh, to give people a perspective uh, that they're not getting in the West right now about what's going on in that part of the world. Certainly, that's admirable. I know Tamara Lawrence tried to, uh, to go to Ukraine, wasn't possible. So you'd be taking a real ball, uh, gutsy step to do that. So see if that happens and see if that's safe for you first and foremost. Uh, but certainly, such initiatives would be. Welcome there, no doubt. All right, Dimitri. Well, 
thank you very much for this interview. I, I hope it's been enlightening uh, for people, for the viewers. And to Camp Falls people, I also just want to remind you that this journalism, it takes money to produce. We've been working hard for more than three years. We've gotten up to around $1,400 in support, which may seem small in comparison to you know, the US outlets and such. But remember, we are fighting on a very tough landscape. But things are changing. Our journalism and the activism of people like Dimitri are producing change in a rising anti-imperialist consciousness. We need anti-imperialist journalism for this moment, and that is what the Can Files provides with original investigations, analysis, these interviews, and there'll be much more in the future. So consider donating to our work and following us on social media, whether that's Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram, and so on. Our name is simple enough to find. It's just the Canada Files. And that's the end of this speaker series interview. Uh, Dimitri, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Aiden. Take care.